At the conclusion of his second voyage, Cook was at last publicly honored. He was the champion of the hour, a national hero. He was awarded the Copley Gold Medal, Britain's highest honor for intellectual achievement, made a fellow of the Royal Society, promoted to post-captain of HMS Kent, and was graciously received by the King, an extraordinary distinction for farmhand's son, graduate of no school, holder of no degree. Meanwhile, the Royal Society was secretly planning a new adventure to attempt to find a fabled Northwest Passage that might connect the North Atlantic to the North Pacific. The Society proposed a two-pronged expedition. One would attempt a northern route through the North Atlantic, while a second would attempt it from the North Pacific. At first, the Admiralty was reluctant to ask Cook, but he was the best and only one for the job in the Pacific. Cook consented and was made commander of the Pacific Expedition that would include two ships, the Resolution and the Discovery. His staff included John Gore, James King and John Williamson as lieutenants, and a master named William Bly, the same Bly who would captain the mutinous bounty. His companion ship, the Discovery, was commanded by Captain James Clerk with George Vancouver, a midshipman. The fixed date for the attempt to find the Northwest Passage was the summer of 1778. They set sail on July 12, 1776. Cook's ships rounded the Cape of Good Hope by October 17th. This time they found Kerguelen Island on Christmas Day and reached Tasmania by January 26, then leisurely sailed among the Tongan Islands from April to July. They arrived in Tahiti on August 12, 1777 and remained there until December when both ships sailed northward crossed the equator, and on December 24th discovered an uninhabited island Cook named Christmas Island. Here they stopped long enough to observe an eclipse of the sun in order to check the accuracy of their chronometers. On January 18, 1778, two mountainous land masses were sighted. Cook was making his last major discovery, the Hawaiian Islands. He named them the Sandwich Islands after his friend and patron, the Earl of Sandwich. Cook anchored at Waimea on the island of Kauai. As he landed, the Hawaiians fell prostrate before him. He was being received with the same respect paid to the half-divine Hawaiian kings, or Ali'i Ai Moku. All of the Hawaiians were friendly, hospitable, and honest. On February 2nd, 1778, the ships set sail for their intended destination, the North Pacific and the Northwest Passage. They reached the Bering Strait and Alaskan waters where navigating became treacherous. In August, the temperature dropped drastically and the ice pack could not be penetrated. To go ahead was futile. The only alternative was to head south and try again the next summer. They sailed on to Unalaska and in the Aleutians, where they spent three weeks repairing their ship. Here they met Russian fur traders and the local Eskimos whom Cook described as the most peaceful and inoffensive people he had ever met. From here the crew headed south again and they reached the Hawaiian Islands on November 26. For two months they lingered in the Hawaiian waters without landing. Whenever their ships neared the islands, however, the native welcome was exuberant. On January 17th, the ship finally anchored in Kealakekua Bay on the Big Island of Hawaii, where 1,500 canoes carrying 9,000 islanders came out to meet them. For the next few days, visits were made by royal personages who brought valuable gifts to Cook and his men. Everything seemed well. Within a week, however, the warm, friendly hospitality turned into cold hostility. Whether the priests believed their power was being overshadowed by the new intruder, or whether Cook's crew had simply worn out their welcome, we will never know. Cook sensed the change of mood and ordered his tents on the beach to be dismantled and planned to sail to Kamchatka on the east coast of Asia. They left on February 4th with an affectionate farewell from the islanders. Within six days, Cook was back again. 
A storm had broken a mast and it needed repairing before further sailing could be done. No warm reception awaited them this time. On February 14, 1779, a large cutter was reported as having been stolen. Cook set his hostage policy in effect. He went ashore accompanied by several armed crewmen and planned to take King Kalani Opu'u as a hostage until his cutter was returned. Though this strategy had served him well in the past, on this occasion, the king's family rushed forth crying and begging them to release their chief. The accounts are confused, but it appears that several thousand Hawaiians gathered quickly. A shot was heard down the beach, and an important chief was reported as having been killed. The Hawaiians grew angry. A melee broke out, and as Cook turned to motion to waiting boats to come closer, he was struck in the back with a club. Several Hawaiians fell upon him, consequently killing him. It was 8 o'clock a.m., and he was only 50 years of age. After a Hawaiian ceremony, his bones were brought aboard the ship and he was buried at sea on February 22, 1779. Clerk and his men sailed the two ships into the Arctic again and had no more success than Cook looking for the famed Northwest Passage. The Resolution and Discovery landed October 4, 1780, after four years and three months at sea, Cook's last voyage. Cook's achievements were unparalleled. Nowhere in the Pacific can one go and not see his influence. He was the first European to chart the Hawaiian Islands between 1778 and 1779. He named them the Sandwich Islands after the expedition's patron, the Earl of Sandwich. Though the first map of the islands published in English is often credited to Cook, it is officially attributed to Lieutenant Henry Roberts, who prepared for publication all of the maps for Cook's third and final voyage. The famed map titled Kealakekua Bay shows the site where Cook landed on his return trip to the Big Island of Hawaii. One of the most decorative of all the early Hawaii maps, Leal de Sandwich by Giovanni Cassini, published in 1798, is based on Cook's chart, but because the artist had little knowledge of Polynesians, he used his imagination to depict a warlike band of American Indians stabbing the captain in the back. This map clearly shows the phonetic spelling used by Captain Cook when attempting to spell the names of the islands. The Hawaiians didn't have a written